And so, how do we do it? How do we teach? How do we put a, a lesson together? If you look on page two, how to rightly divide the word of truth. And I'm going to move through this kind of quickly. And I, I'll give you the words to, to fill in as we go down. But number one, pray. Pray. I think it was, I think it was Spurgeon who said, when he sat down in his study, the first three things he did was pray. <coughs> and pray, and then he would pray. Because apart from God, we will butcher the Bible. No matter how much information we get from others, we will take that information and twist it. Even if it's good and right and correct information, we'll take it and twist it when we're giving it to others. Because that's just, we, we, we are still trapped in bodies of flesh, and we need God to eliminate His truth to us. Jesus told the apostles, I'm sending the Spirit, one of the ministries of the Spirit, that He will remind you, He will enlighten you, He will teach you those things which I have said. We need, to, you know, I tell that one thing that I use to, uh, to kind of get people to, to understand what's called illumination is this. Those old commercials, Motel 6, will leave the light on for you. You can read a text. I think you know that text. And you can even gather good, right, truthful information about that text. But the Holy Spirit of God's got to turn that light on. He has to illuminate it. Then it becomes real in your heart. And here, here are some of the things that I pray about when I'm preparing a message or a lesson. Uh, the first thing is, I pray that God would help me in my weakness. Because I realize that I'm, I, it's going to be wasted time if God's not with me. And I, I put one of my favorite little quotes down there on the paper. The power of God must first be with you in the preparation or it will not be with you in the presentation. You can't spend two minutes with God this week and then show up and teach for an hour and thank God's going to bless that. You need to spend some time with Him. You need to ask for His help. You need to pray that God would, would overcome your flesh. That you wouldn't say or do anything that contradicted His word or led people astray. That's a powerful thing when you standing up in front of a group of people you're sitting at the end of the table, whether it's children or, or adults or couples, regardless of the setting, or, or, or a ladies' group or a men's group, whatever it is, you, you are assuming an authoritative position with the Word of God. When you're opening your mouth, what you're basically telling them, this is what God has said in His Word. So we want to make sure we get that right. And to truly get that right, God's got to be there with us. He has to guide. He has to lead. He has to open up and illuminate the word for our hearts. And something else that I, that I pray about, I always pray, Lord, don't let me get anything off my chest. You know, I, I, you can listen to some guys on the radio or whatever, and you kind of get the feeling that they sit in front of the television watching the news all week. They get up there. Let me tell you what this politician is doing, what that politician is doing, and the world's going to hell in the handbag, and here's why, and this group and that group. You can tell they're mad, they're angry, they don't like what's happening, and they're getting it off their chest. I don't want to get stuff off my chest. I want to pour out of my heart what God has poured in my heart from His Word. And i got to pray about that. Because I'm just like everybody else. I get frustrated by what's going on in the world. And, and yet, I need to get out of my heart what God put in, not just dump it off my chest. This is what's on my chest. This is what's bothering me, so I'm going to go in there and I'm going to dump it on those people. That's not beneficial. And, and God won't bless me. Uh, that, that comes from a place of agitation and it will be received in hearts and agitate them. And then you just got a bunch of agitated people. So I'm going to pour something out of the heart where the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, meekness, gentleness, self-control. I want those things to be invested in people's lives. So I really gotta, I really gotta pray. God, you gotta be with me. You gotta help me. You gotta guide me. It'll lead me through this text. And number two, read it. If you don't know the text, you can't teach the text. <laughs> and, and one thing that I will do when I'm preparing a message or a lesson or whatever, um, I will get my Bible and I just Around with me, and I'll read it several times. 
ought to be it. And then I've got a whole shelf of Bibles. And it takes a minute to do this. I go through each one of them and read that text. That's why you hear me sometimes on a Sunday morning. I'll be talking about a term. And I'll say, and some of your Bibles may say this, this, or this, or this. Because we got folks out of there carrying every kind of translation in the world today. Folks are carrying them around with them. So sometimes when I'm standing here reading, they're like, where's he getting his word from? So you've got to kind of help people. But I want to be as familiar with that text, just in the language that God has blessed us to have in there. I just want to be familiar with it. I, I want to know it. And, and I'll tell you another little trick that I do. I'll write it out. There are, there are studies that have been done that tell us that there are cognitive skills that get engaged when you have a pen or, or a pencil in your hand even more so than when you type. Nothing wrong with type, don't get me wrong. But you engage more cognitive skills with this because it slows you down. And you can't backspace and delete. You don't have autocorrect. So your mind thinks, I need to be more careful without you even realizing. And you will retain more information. A lot of times I write and read it. And then number three, interpreting the text is what we want to do. You're going to see a blank space on number three. Here's number three. I'm going to give you three things. There are three rules that apply to every passage of Scripture and how you interpret it and understand it. Three rules. Context, context, context. Those are the three rules of interpretation. Context, context, context. You say, what do you mean by context, context, context? Every verse... Here in like my Bible's open to Ephesians. Every verse is a part of a chapter, which chapters and verses were added later on for reference sake. But every statement is a part of a, of a longer thought, which is a part of a whole book of Ephesians, a whole letter. And what we have to do is we need to be familiar with the letter. If I'm going to be talking to you about Ephesians this week, and you, you'll see what we mean there by, by context. And by the way, every letter, Ephesians, is a part of the whole Bible. In other words, what I'm teaching you out of, let's say, Ephesians 2.18, it, uh, it cannot contradict what Ephesians 4.2 says. And if I get those two in line, if what I'm saying contradicts what is found in Matthew's gospel or in 1 John, I've still got a problem because this letter is a part of the whole Bible. So when we're talking about context, we're talking about understanding it within the context in which it was written, understanding it within the context of that whole letter, and understanding it within the context of the whole Bible. Bible. There are no contradictions in God's Word. None. So I uh, want to keep it in context. Here's what that looks like. Background and setting. What was happening there? What was taking place? Uh, the, the author, uh, who is his audience? In other words, who is this text talking to? That's very important. Um, the overall theme of the book Example would be Galatians. The theme of Galatians is justification by faith. I think Galatians is the Wednesday night text. Hey, it's justification by faith. And Paul's having to deal with legalists and Pharisees and Judaizers and all these other people because they're trying to undermine faith in Christ and trying to make it about works and religious zeal and effort. And so, but that whole book ties into that one theme that every passage in there goes back to that one thing, the gospel of Christ and faith in Christ. And then, uh, I put this down there too, prescription versus description. There are passages of scripture, especially when you have lengthy narratives, per se, in the Old Testament, or, or lengthy narrative about what was happening, uh, say, in an event in the book of Acts. Those are descriptions not prescriptions. 
Here's what I mean. This is a prescription. God says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself to We know that, right? We're all familiar with that. That is a prescription. This is God telling you what you need to do. The prophet was on his way to Jerusalem on his mule to deliver the oracle of God. That is a description. I shared this with our folks. Some of you were here a few weeks ago when I talked about, I, I'd heard a message one time where this guy mentioned, we're not even talking about Balaam and the talking donkey. Let's talking about a random text where it said the prophet was riding uh, you know, his mule, his donkey into, the, into Israel and he was supposed to deliver this message. This guy preached for 55 minutes on what kind of donkey you're riding. Are you riding a blessed donkey or are you riding a, a, a narrow-minded donkey? And he's all in it. People were throwing a fit. God, stop telling us that there's no <laughs> mystical, spiritual donkey that we're riding around on. That had nothing to do with any. And it's exciting. That gets people fired up. And he was telling them how they could be rich. But the text doesn't have anything to do with that. It was just a narrative saying, this is how he was getting there. <laughs> And, and where we get in, in danger with this stuff is if we're going to take descriptive texts and try to make them prescriptive, try to invent these neat little <laughs> messages. Number four, help. Number four, help. This may shock some of us, but long before we ever came along, people were teaching God's Word. And the interesting thing is, you can go back to Athanasius. You can look at <coughs> Augustine. You can see people throughout the dark age. You can look at Luther, Zwingli, Spurgeon, Edwards. You look all through history. And you find evangelicals all through history. And they will take a text of scripture. And when they're done, they all seem to agree on it. So here's what I've learned. If I can look back through 1900 years of Christianity and I see every faithful man and woman of God have believed this verse taught this, but I'm saying it does something different, I'm probably the one that's wrong. I'm probably the one that's wrong here. <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is uh, you, you can, you know, not everybody doesn't know everything. None of us. As a matter of fact, we, we would probably be shocked to know how much we don't know <laughs> and how much we need to depend on the Lord. And not only the Lord, but I remind you, He gave gifts to His church. He gave the apostles, and prophets, and evangelists, and pastors, and teachers, faithful stewards of God's Word who faithfully taught the Word. And while we put no person on a pedestal with the Holy Spirit, not by any stretch of the imagination. We need to use the gifts that God gave to the church. And he's given some amazing gifts. And if you look down at the bottom of that page, uh, unlike commentaries, uh, these are people who have invested their entire lives in going through the whole Bible and using all the, the other help they can get to say, hey, this is kind of how we've understood these things. And, and this is what the Bible's teaching. And they'll, they'll give you interesting uh, thoughts about particular Greek or Hebrew or, or, or Aramaic terms. And they'll enlighten you to things that maybe you didn't already know. But I put a whole list of them on there. And so we need help. There's nothing wrong with getting help. God bless the church with helps. So when we know that these resources are out there, we should use them. It doesn't mean that we're we're just getting everything we get from a man or or we're just it doesn't mean that. It means that in the same way that that a couple weeks ago I come in here, sat over here on a Wednesday night, Dwayne taught the lesson. I thank God for the help that he gave me. I thank God for that. And I, I didn't put him on a pistol or make an idol out of him in that Wednesday night class. Didn't do any of that. I just thank God for investing in someone else who didn't turn around and make that investment in it. You know, 
what Paul told Timothy? Everything that I've instructed you, it's you some men together, and you instruct them. So that someday they can get some young men together, they can instruct them. In other words, God has blessed certain people with certain gifts. And we, we, need to, we need to use those gifts. We need to receive those gifts. We need to use those help. And there's tons of good helps out there. Number five, number five, notes. I know one of my favorite little sayings is milk every cow you can and churn your own butter. Take notes. Just, just take notes on the text. Take notes when you're reading what somebody else says. Take notes when you're looking at other versions and you see that different words are being used because you want to remember that because some of your folks are going to be using those different words. Just take notes. But don't take, for instance, John Gill's comments on Ephesians 2, 1 through 4. And in your whole message, <laughs> it's basically John Gill's comments on Ephesians 2, 1 through 4. Gather all the information you can, milk every cow you can, but then sit down and work out your own lesson. Take it all in and work out your own lesson. Lesson number six, connections. Connecting the text with other texts paints a clearer picture. The best way to do that, if you look down at the bottom under helps, under connections, Thompson Chain Reference Bible is the best Bible for that, but the treasury of scripture knowledge is the best. Because here's what a concordance does. If you look up, per se, blood in a concordance, it'll show you where that word is used. But it doesn't always mean the same thing in every verse. What the treasury of scripture knowledge does is if you're looking up blood, and it's the blood of Jesus, it will show you every reference to the blood of Jesus, even if it doesn't use the particular word for it. It'll show you if you're looking up uh, faith, faith uh, to be saved, believing faith, saving faith. It'll show you every reference for saving faith. Those passages, not just a verse, sometimes an entire passage. And those connections are crucial because remember, context, context, context. If I'm preaching from a text that talks about forgiveness, I need to know everything the Bible says about forgiveness that I can possibly know. I don't want to say anything to contradict anywhere else. Because if I'm doing that, then I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting it wrong. I need some help. So when we're drawing from other connections, we're getting a bigger, broader picture of what the whole Bible teaches on something. Number teaches on something. Number seven, an outline. And I, I use this in a in a in a college that I lectured at one time to a group of preaching students. Road signs should get you where you need to be without confusion. All of us here have been in some little town, halfway lost in our life, trying to follow signs in that town and getting more lost as we go. Your outline, when, you, when you've worked out your outline and, and you look back over at yourself and you're reading over your notes, you need to ask yourself, if I'm on this end of town, I need to get over there. Is this going to get me there, or am I going to end up more confused along the way? Because an outline is basically an introduction, certain steps or points, and then the destination. In other words, I might come in here today and say, God will bless your family. He will. That's the introduction. Here are steps what you need to do. Husbands need to do certain things. Wives need to do certain things. Children need to do certain things. Grandparents need to do certain things. you got your points. And when all those things are being done according to God's will and word, the destination is God will bless you. Right? That, that's really simple. But we can sure chase rabbits and get sidetracked. <laughs> we, can, we can get off on talking about what's going on in the governor's race if we're not careful. We need to make sure that our outline and our lesson says, here's what we want you to know. Here's how it happens. Now you know it. Here's what God says he'll do. Here's what you need to do. And then God will do it. It's very, very simple. The kiss, that's the most important thing, by the way. Getting the lesson right. Getting the word right. Getting the truth right. The truth matters. We get
get that lesson right, we get that word right, we deliver it, everything else is between them and God. If we've done, if we have, we have discharged our duty, and we stand up or sit at the end of that table or stand in that classroom and we say, this is what God's word says. I'll warn you of what happens if you don't obey it. Talk about the blessings of God if you do obey it. Now we charge you to do what God tells you to do in his word. We discharge our duty. Inside the classroom, just some, just some real quick tips there. Number one, make everyone feel welcome. There's no room for groups within the group. This is on page three. Uh, stress often uh, the need for everyone to be a greeter. Nobody should feel alone. If somebody comes to uh, like a Wednesday night class, Sunday school class, even comes to church, they shouldn't feel alone. And what we do sometimes is we think, well, our church is a friendly church because when people come in, we get up and shake their hand. <coughs> but then... We leave them sitting alone or standing alone, and we go right back to our little group. And we stand there and talk. And that person is kind of standing there, well, that's nice, they shook my hand, but where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? Well, do I sit here? Do I move over there? Is there somebody see? We need to you know, make sure that everybody understands the importance of it. Don't exclude the Try to make sure everybody feels welcome and feels a part of it. No one should feel alone. Uh, Make prayer a priority rather than secondary. Stress the importance of God's people praying together. Uh, I've been in Sunday school classes before where it's like prayer is just something you've got to get out of the way so we can get into the lesson. But it's not. The greatest moves of God that we read about in the book of Acts, many of them started when God's people took time together, bring their hearts together in covenant agreement and pray. So we need to stress the importance of praying together. Number three, make sure prayer concerns aren't distractions or gossip. About ten years ago, I quit taking prayer concerns on Sunday evening here. And the reason I would, God, for whatever reason, it was always on Sunday evening. We need to pray for Thelma down here. She's going to have thyroid surgery. Or she's going to have this out of the other surgery. Well, ain't Thelma married to Fred that used to work down at down the Dairy Queen here? Yeah. Well, what happened to their daughter? And we would sit here for 10 minutes. Where, where, where does their cousin, didn't their cousin work out to the salt mill on Indian Creek? Yeah, I think so. Didn't he get hurt and cut his finger off? Yeah, and it's like that one fellow did. You know, that guy that lived up on, and he would just go on and on and on. It'd take up 20 minutes. And it didn't have anything to do with it. And by the time they would get finished, I, would, I wouldn't remember what the prayer concern was. Because we've chased down everybody's aunt and uncle and all this other stuff that ain't got anything to do with anything. And it, everything you add, by the way, to a class, everything you add, let's say this cup is full of God's Word. You throw a chunk of ice in there some of that word's going to come out. You throw another chunk of ice in there, some of that word's going to come out. Everything you throw in there, more of that word comes out. And before you know it, you've got a cup of ice of very little word. And we got to be careful with prayer concern time that it doesn't turn into, you know, where's everybody from? A big distraction. Also, you know, we don't want people, we want to try. We do our best. We can't just, you can't control what people are going to jump up and say, but, you know, you also want to, we want to curb. We want to take time every now and then to say, and take prayer concerns, but let's keep it focused on the concern and let's not gossip about anybody. Because I was at a, I was at a little revival meeting one night that I was preaching at years ago, and this lady stood up in the back of the church. We were up in Bethel. She stood up in the back of the church and swear, we need to pray for Billy. I swear he's sleeping with his neighbor. I know he is. <laughs> and. I looked at that preacher and I thought, oh my Lord, how's he going to handle this? He just said, let's pray. <laughs> you just said he was, he had no idea what to do. So every now and then it's good when you're taking prayer concerns in your class, even with kids, to say, this is a very serious time. They want it to be real concerns. And, and by the way, if you've ever worked with kids or, or someone who worked with kids, 
let them praise them. It might shock you. It, it, it touches your heart. But these little ones are listening sometimes better than everybody else. And they can really meaningfully put their little hands together. Chloe prayed in there one night when I was coming in. I heard her. And she put her little hands together. And, pray, and she was so sincere. She was talking to the Lord. And I'm afraid sometimes we as adults aren't doing that. We're just going through the words, going through the motions, because it's part of what we're supposed to do. She was sincerely talking to the Lord. So we need to stress prayer, but we need to make sure it doesn't become distractions or gossip. Uh, involve the class or group, and when people have an opportunity to willingly take part, they take ownership. The only thing I'm warned about that is, like you got a new person there, like anybody sitting in here today, I wouldn't care to say, Today, what do you think about this? You know, to get a conversation. Oh, you got a new person there, you don't really know them, don't put them on the spot. They may be an introvert that don't want anybody looking at them. So, you know, don't, don't, don't put people on the spot like that. But when you get people involved, you find ways, whether it's through discussion or other things, they take ownership. That becomes their class. Then. And, and they'll become more faithful to it. Uh, number five, never allow input from the class time to steal, or to the class to steal time away from instruction. Remember, teaching the Word of God is our priority. Uh, sometimes it can get out of hand. And for those of us who've led adult groups, I know Dwayne has, Tammy has, I have. If you ever led an adult group where discussion gets off, sometimes the discussion is good, the testimonies are good, but it can get a little out of hand. <laughs> where you kind of forget, even as the teacher, wait, what am I teaching here? I, I, I kind of get, you know, it can get out of hand. So we have to find loving ways to kind of keep that rein in. And, you know, you just have to pray about how God would lead you to do that. Number six, in times of group or class sharing, focus on the solution, not the problem. It's common in small groups for church bashing and preacher bashing and family bashing and neighbor bashing and all that kind of stuff to start. We don't want people leaving out of here aggravated and mad together. We want them leaving out of here encouraged and excited about the Lord together. So we want to make sure to keep it focused on the solution. Uh, make sure every lesson contains the law and the gospel. Uh, nobody should, should ever leave with a vague notion of who God is. Um, at some point, you remember what, what was all the first things we looked at even in this little thing here, going through this material. We've seen them. We need a Savior. Jesus is the Savior. At some point in every class, uh, Leanne and I, we, we got, because of some, some scheduling conflicts and Carol's granny sick and everything else, we, we learned a new respect for Danita and Carol Wednesday night. First of all, it's the hottest room in the history of the world. <laughs> and we have like, we were up in the teens with the number of 16 children in there. And, and the more they wiggled and moved, the hotter it got. But we did a very simple lesson. The ABCs of Christianity and yet believe you confess. But you know, adults need to hear that. Mm -hmm. There may be people sitting in their Sunday school class or small group class or seminar you may whatever. There may be people sitting in there that have been <coughs> church members. For 20 years. They don't know the Lord. They need to hear the law. That we've all seen broken God's law. Deserve his wrath. And they need to hear the gospel. Jesus saves. That somewhere. That message. That lesson. Whatever. That has to be incorporated week in and week out. Uh, number eight. Take time to stress the importance of everyone's responsibility to be on mission. We're here to equip people so they can go out in the world and share the gospel. Uh, encourage people. To go out and share what God's doing in their life. That's the simplest way. David said in the song, I'm going to boast about the great things you've done for me. I will not hide it. I'm going to boast about it. To, to even the heathen, David said, to anybody that will listen, we need to encourage our folks to do that. Hey, if you were blessed tonight, you will back out and share it with somebody else. Share what God's doing. Um, Number nine, develop class projects. When a class or group works together to bless someone or take part in an event, it develops a stronger bond and helps people put feet to their faith. Uh, and that bubbles over to their everyday life. Like if, if say on, um, for example, Wednesday night, the adult auditorium class, somebody says that 
you know, Dora's been really sick again this week. She's not able to do anything or whatever, or, or someone else. And Dwayne might say, well, hey, how about as a class? Let's fix a meal this weekend, and we'll figure out a way for us to get the food together, and somebody can take it to the store. Suddenly, that's not just come to church and sit in the class. We just became missionaries together to help somebody who needed it. And that gets people even more invested in your class. Number 10, structure, structure, structure. As Paul told the Corinthians, the Holy Spirit of God is not the author of confusion. He's commanded that all things be done orderly. Therefore, the point is, keep control of the class or group and make sure that the main thing, discipling through teaching the Bible, stays the main thing. Because we can get sidetracked with other stuff. We can get sidetracked with other things. Uh, warnings down at the bottom. And I, uh, as I was reading through some of this stuff, uh, I didn't put all of the things from all of the, the stuff that I gathered together in here, but I just put a few for brevity's sake. But these are ones that I was reading through this list. This hit me. These are things I've had to wrestle with. Number one, be very careful with the sin of pride. Because when we see things happening, we have a tendency to say, look what I'm doing. We need to be reminded God's doing it. But you know what the other side of that coin is? Number two, be very careful with the sin of faithlessness. God started with 12, and one of them was a devil. But look at the whole world and the amount of believers in the world because those 11 and one born out of due time, Paul, gave us the New Testament and the Gospels come to the whole world. The Lord only needs a few. He can take one or two and do great things. He says, guard against a mentality of exclusivity. In other words, here's the best way to put that. Carol has got a bunch of kids on Wednesday night. Carol wants to remember that on Sunday morning, Children's Church, a lot of those kids are here. Leanne's got a lot of those kids in the youth group. We've got kids that are going back to the nursery with little toddlers and stuff. And Wednesday's not exclusive from all of that. We all need to work together. We need to kind of be on the same page together with other teachers and other classes and other things that are going on. So it's not a matter of exclusivity, but inclusivity. And we need to encourage each other. Uh, remember what your role is in the church. I was talking to my friend, Brother Ron, the other day, and one of the problems that they had in their, uh, their church years ago is they had a lady who was a small group leader. And everybody that had a concern, my church take care of that. Maybe you're not the treasurer. <laughs> you're not in charge of doling out money. But then people would come to the pastoral staff and say, well, where are y'all going to take care of it? Take care of what? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, my small group leader said, y'all pay for this. I'll take care of this. <laughs> and, and so we need to be careful to remember what our role is there and that we can't speak for the treasurer. We can't speak for the other teachers and, 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 and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, you know what the church teaches, number five, so don't go well because you're accountable. Uh, I can give you one example. If you look on the very, very back page, I think I stapled it on there for you. You should see a, a little thing there. And if you go to our church's website, you click on the link, what we believe, it will have a little link at the top of that that shows you a whole like doctrine or statement or whatever. But down below that, this is what we teach. What we teach. And this is what we as a church teach. And I just printed this off for one example. Sanctification. We believe that every person who comes to Christ is sanctified, set apart unto God. They're holy. They're called saints in the New Testament. That's every person. That's positional. But we also believe by the work of the Holy Spirit, God is at work in us, sanctifying us every day. There's a work that happens every single day. So, as a result, we've got to understand that there's a conflict in every believer. The flesh says, I don't want to do what God 
God wants me to do. The Spirit says you better do what God wants you to do. So we need to help one another grow in progressive sanctification. And simple little things like that, that we can, you know, say your lessons on sanctification this week. And, and that's a good way to go there. And you'll see a zillion scripture reference. Every statement, there's a scripture reference behind it because we don't want to say anything God's Word doesn't say. And those are good little helps, to, by the way, to be able to go to. Uh, number six, don't allow yourself to always be the hero of every story. God loves humility, not pride. If all of your illustrations for your lesson that you're trying to help your kids or adults with are all things of how you end up being the hero, you might want to check your pride at the door. You know what I found as a pastor, as a teacher? People love humility and transparency. And they love when the leader or the teacher of that class says, you know what, guys, that's a tough lesson for me because I really have problems with these. I struggle with unforgiveness. I struggle with, with anger. I struggle with whatever. And in that moment, everybody else there realizes the ground around the cross is level, but we all struggle with this. And it will open up the opportunity for maybe somebody to speak up and say, you know what, this is an area I really need prayer in. Because this is something that God's deeply convicted me over, and I just can't break through. It may, you see what I'm saying, it may open doors of opportunity to minister that you weren't aware of. Uh, number seven, never neglect your own family. She can minister to others. Just, just be very careful. Studying God's Word is exciting. Preparing lessons is exciting. Working with children or, or adults or youth is exciting. But I can't allow my family to suffer because I'm all excited about this. You get what I'm saying? It's the Lord first, and I want to serve Him and honor Him. But we can never forget that if we're a husband or a wife or a mom or a dad or a son or a daughter, that to honor God, we have to do what He says in our family too. We don't sacrifice one for the other. We don't sacrifice the ministry of teaching for our family. We don't sacrifice our family for the ministry of teaching. And we've got to learn to, and sometimes it's hard to learn that balance. But we don't want to neglect our families. Uh, and also, number eight, stewardship applies to teaching as well. In other words, don't break yourself buying stuff for your class. You would be surprised that if you would stand up on a Sunday and say, hey, our class needs some of this, that, or the other, of how many people might come to you and say, hey, we want to help. It's okay to ask for help. Don't break yourself. And, and that's, talk about folks struggling, that's something that I struggle and wrestle with. It's very hard for me to tell the church there's a need. I just, I've always been... The kind of person that somebody tells me there's a need, I go batty, I'll sit up for two days and nights and then go to sleep worrying about how can I help them. I just feel like it becomes my responsibility. And I'm trying to be better here as of late when it becomes a, a big thing that would really put me and Jessica in a bind to be able to reach out to my child. I said, okay guys, we need help. And it's amazing. Everybody's always willing to help. But don't try to help others without asking your class to help you. Because there, there'll be some On the final page, we'll move through this real quick and we'll be done. This is for children and youth. And it's sad that we even have to say a couple of these things. But number one, don't become Lloyd the legalist. Don't become Lloyd the legalist. Here's what I mean. We will get together with a group of adults and we'll start telling them that they're sinners and they need a savior. Jesus is the one who died for their sins, was raised from the dead, conquered hell, death, and the grave, and they need to turn to him. Will same person bring in a group of young people? Here's who you need to date, and here's how you need to go on a date, and here's how you need to wear your clothes, and here's what kind of music you should. We suddenly, we get all legalistic with you. They're sinners who need a savior too. Uh, you know, we get, we, we, just because the, the age changes, the message doesn't. They need the gospel. They need, to hear, they need to hear about Christ. They are no different from adults. You can't clean a fish until you catch it. 
We don't expect lost people to obey God. So don't expect young people and children to obey God until they know the Lord and then the Spirit of God will empower them to obey God. So don't become a legalist with children. Number two, activities, crafts, games, whatever you're doing, you should advance the lesson. Uh, try to incorporate things that advance your lesson. We played a family feud game the other night that was about things you take into your body and, and ultimately the, the lesson was going to be the treasures that God gives us in earth and vest. So it was kind of, it went along and sat there, their thinking along those lines of putting things in something. And we talked about the investment that God gave us of the gospel, that we need to share it with people. But it was everything was tied together to the lesson. It kind of goes back, remember? Your outline, you don't want them lost along the way, all over the place. Let's tie everything together. Number three, never be afraid to ask for helpers. Never be afraid to ask for help. I, I was never more happy to have help than I was Wednesday night. I just, I'm getting a little lost in, in a room with 17 youngs or 16 youngs or whatever. What I was thankfully in was there and was, was willing to help. Uh, number four, watch out for wonders. Watch out for wonders. A few years ago I was filling in for a children's Sunday school class. Started out with five kids, and we were doing our little craft, and I was all into helping this little girl with the craft, and I looked up, and I had four kids. <laughs> I had to go find one. <laughs> and, and if you haven't noticed, some children are wonders. They'll take off on you. They'll say they're going to the bathroom, and they never come back. And we have to remember, you know, that stuff is cute. It's funny, and I get tickled at it, too. But we're responsible for those little ones. We need to know where they are. We don't want some kid out playing, playing in the road when they said they were going to the bathroom or some kid getting hurt or doing something they shouldn't be doing. Destroying property or outside messing with somebody's car. Because kids will, kids are going to be kids. They are. We, we, we need to watch the wonders. Number five, never take on the role of therapist. The middle of your lesson, talking about David and Goliath, is not the time to stop the whole class and let every kid listen to you be the therapist for one child and everything. If a kid discloses something to you um, that really concerns you, then you need to talk to a member of that child's family. You need to, uh, and be very, here's the one that we shouldn't even have to put in here, but we have to these days. Number six, be very careful with physical contact. I don't know if you all know this or not, but in the day and time we live in, a hug can be used against you by the wrong person, especially when it comes to youth. Seven, uh, never take on the role of parent, correct, but never discipline. You know, you know, we had to, at one point Wednesday night, we had to have one little boy come over to the other table and one little girl go over here because we, there was some rowdiness going on, so we had to do a little correction. But we're not going to take somebody out in the hallway and spank them or, or be mean to them or anything like that. Hey, go get mom. Someone's out of control. Go get daddy and say, you know, come and do something. Kids out of control. And by the way, sometimes just threatening to go get mom and daddy will calm things down real quick. But we want to be careful. We can correct, but we don't want to take on the role of parent. I'm going to discipline this child and, and, and be a little rough when we don't, we don't want to do that. Uh, number eight, remember that you are a teacher, not an entertainer. It's good to have games and things like that that you do with kids, but remember, they still need to leave out of their learning. They need to know something about the Lord whenever they leave there. Number nine, encourage the class to take part in outreach. Okay. Number ten, utilize teaching incentives. It's a proven method to help children retain information. It's like I did with totally in. You get the kids to learn the Greek alphabet song. I'll have a pizza party for them. You start offering stuff like that, kids get more excited to do things. Imagine the thought. <laughs> you would be surprised at what information you can get children to memorize that way. And I heard a testimony from one of my favorite preachers one time. And he 
it's time that Harry came to Lord. He got deeply convicted over his sin. He hadn't been in church since he was a little, little kid when he used to go to Bible school. And in that week of Bible school, if you learned John 3.16 and Romans 10.13 by the end of the week, if you could memorize it, and could say it whenever they called on you, you got like this little paper for a local frosty freeze would give you an ice cream. You know what he memorized? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And Romans 10, 13, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And with a hangover and overwhelmed with guilt and a guilty conscience, sitting in his house one day, he realized what a sinful and wicked life he lived. But he didn't think there was any hope in suddenly he remembered the word of God that he memorized as a little child. Get kids to memorize stuff. They'll stay with them forever. 